I'm going to talk about this, um, designing government services that meet user needs. So yeah, I work at the Government Digital Service, um, or short GDS, and we are part of the UK Cabinet Office, which is the most central part of the UK government. Um, so we are about um, 800 people um, in East London, so we are not in Westminster, where most of the civil servants are. Um, so you see the environment is, is kind of like a few hundred years old. It rather, rather looks like a, like a tech startup, and we are purposefully um, well, just around the corner from, from all the um, Ubers and, and, and co. This is uh, some of us. So we have um, developers, we have policy people, we have data analysts, user researchers, product, product managers, you name it, all in that building. Um, and our task is that, um, helping departments to create and deliver better services. And also, as part of that, help them um, in their digital transformation, because this is quite a big job. Um, and beyond our building, there are about 18,000 um, people working in digital, in data and technology profession. So this is roughly uh, the same number of people that we have as well in policy. Um, and this is all across um, central government, so across about um, yeah, um, 25 ministries and all their um, smaller organizations. And among the many, many things that uh, the Government Digital Service uh, is doing is, well, looking after GovUK, which is one single website, one single website. <laughs> and it's, it's the front door um, to government services um, in the country. Um, before we had that, we had about, well, we had 2,000. We have different numbers, but like something between um, 1,800 and 2,000 different websites. Um, and they all had different appearances, and people find it often hard um, to actually like, yeah, find the thing uh, they were looking for or doing the thing they wanted to achieve. Um, so now, whatever department, um, their services are live on gov.uk, um, and they look the same, they uh, behave the same, and as well, they feel the same. So people have um, quite an increased level of trust when they come back and do yet a different task, but it kind of like feels similar. Um, so it makes the use of services easier um, and throughout that kind of like um, familiarity we can as well increase um, the trust um, of uh, in government. Um, and well unifying um, a few hundred uh, websites was not about websites only. It was fundamentally about um, service transformation and now um, quite a bit of the content that we have on gov.uk is also accessible via voice interfaces like Alexa, Siri and, and, and Google Home um, and gov.uk keeps evolving um, just like the behavior of people, just like technology and also government. Well, you might be, don't believe it but government is as well evolving. <laughs> Um, and um, this is all, all great and we have made a lot of progress when it comes to like, uh, transactions but this is really the, the hard thing as we heard uh, in the previous talks, delivering whole services for users. Things from, from our perspective uh, are often very different to what users see. Um, for them, uh, it might be about, well, starting a business, it might be about cannabis, it might be about something else <laughs> or buying a house um, or learning to drive a car. Services are not life events, but often life events trigger um, and make you want to use a certain service or need to use a certain service. But what we see is government is simply not meeting uh, the needs of users. And we have heard this as well. Um, for example, um, you need to interact with up to 12 different parts of the UK government if you want to start a business. So here's what this might roughly look like. You need to do um, one thing um, related to starting a business. So let's assume this is starting a business. And you have to interact with all these different government departments, but all of them are very isolated and independent. So even if you deal with department A, the user will be asked about the same thing again and again, because these dots are simply not joined up and, and connected. Um, and something we just heard from Mark uh, is as well that. So like, why, why is this? happening because all those services often cut across organizational structures. These are some of the um, central government departments we have in the UK. Um, because ser uh, services, as citizens see them, cut um, through departmental boundaries, right? So it's not just that department or that department in charge, but all of them in a different way. And then if you zoom in um, to those um, bubbles, 
you have in those ministries and in these departments a lot of other silos. Often they are related to the professions they have. Because these people should as well have way more exchange. The policy people are just um, throwing things over, over the fence and then they're going to be picked up <laughs> by someone else. Like this is unfortunately the reality. And this results in those things, right? Um, so teams and departments often creating like isolated transactions um, that might not make sense in the context of the user. Often they still rely on decade-old kind of like paper logic and there's a lot of duplication. So citizens again being asked again and again about the same thing. And well, here's a bit like how we address that. This is our, our approach uh, that we are taking. We look at end-to-end -end services as users see them. And this means not just like the web front end, but also like all the underlying processes. Uh, Michelle had this great uh, overview. Uh, so a lot of procedures and processes that nobody else sees because they're behind the, cur uh, the curtain. Um, and often we have to replace a lot of like old legacy systems that kind of like hold us back. Um, but at the same time, also make sure that we not only fix um, the digital channel, but make sure that services work in all the channels that users um, are using them. And why is that? So because, well, users of government services don't really have a choice, right? So they have to use those services. I mean, they can practically move to another city or so, uh, but like, this is often <laughs> not the reality of, of things. So there are, there are no um, alternatives. Unlike a private company, we cannot choose um, the people we are serving. Um, so government services need literally to work for, for everyone, whatever their background, whatever their capability or whatever their, their um, ability um, is. So we have to start with users, we have to understand their needs, needs and then help design services around, around user needs. And I saw someone has, do you want to stand up, have a, have a user's first <laughs> shirt actually. I haven't seen this merch yet, it's lovely. I, I want to have one of those. Um, um, and, and practically, um, here's what this looks like uh, on Gov.uk. Uh, this is our latest version of, of service navigation. It kind of like stitches together transactions and content around one um, core user need in order to uh, achieve a goal. So this, for example, is around like driving abroad. You have a detailed step-by-step um, -step explanation. People can tap or uh, click on those and you learn about the, the certain things you have to do. Um, and even if you um, come from uh, let's say search engine, uh, you land somewhere in the, in the middle of that thing, you can still see that it's part of, of, of something bigger because there's a, there's a link to that. So people understand what they have to do in what order. We have experienced that and we have a lot of evidence built over the years that taking a user-centered approach de-risks uh, the things we're working on because we know what works and what not works by, uh, by researching all the stuff, uh, testing it through prototypes, and evaluating those things and repeating this until we know we get it right. And we have uh, created design principles um, that underpin all of that work. They guide um, us um, on, on their way. And it's a bit small for, especially for people in the, in the back. Um, but they include points like uh, number one, starting with user needs, uh, things like uh, design with data or iterate, then iterate again. Um, but they also contain uh, things like that, uh, doing less and doing the hard uh, work to make it simple. And this then um, leads us um, to the Gaf UK design system, uh, a thing we uh, have launched uh, I think about a year ago now, and it contains visual styles and components and patterns. Um, so service teams and all those 25 different departments don't have to reinvent the wheel or like, do the things that other teams have been already solving before. So can they simply reuse uh, a well-designed accessible <coughs> component uh, like that one around um, asking for a date of birth because even in that kind of like fairly simple thing you can do a lot of things wrong. They have all the code then just grab and use this component um, free of charge which is really really important. So in order to um, scale service uh, transformation, we need to standardize things um, instead of constantly um, doing the thing all over again and again. And well, talking about standardization and standards, um, we do have standards uh, both for technology and as well as services, um, which is really important because these are just not um, nice to haves, uh, but they're man mandatory and all of the services that go live on gov.uk, they are being assessed against those standards. And just, um, I think, two weeks ago, we launched the latest version of our standard, 
Before, um, the thing was called the digital service standard. Uh, we've been slowly working uh, ourselves like out of the digital uh, bubble because, well, we have to make sure that we fix services um, holistically. And that, I mean, there's something that Carrie talked as well about, right? You, you fix kind of the digital, and once you, you've done that, uh, you branch out and make sure that all the other channels work as well. Uh, so these are 14 points covering uh, everything from meeting user needs to providing a good service and using as well the right technology. And um, having standards is really, really good, um, but it's simply not enough. Um, so it's just like the underlying building block, if you like. But you have to have as well like other things in place uh, that make sure that these standards are really um, fulfilled and upheld, and also make sure that service teams are really supported. Um, so we have an insurance process, we have assessments, where service teams then have to demonstrate that they have fulfilled those standards and all those um, 14 points uh, that are in the service standard. And we help them, uh, for example, through training. So uh, we have uh, quite a range of like digital design and agile skill trainings that we offer. And I think throughout the last five years or so, um, we have trained more than, than 10,000 people. And the team that um, Karen and I are working with, uh, just like last year, uh, we have trained more than, I think, 1,300 people. Um, specifically in user research, and accessibility and design and the demand is just like it's, it's pretty insane with super long waiting lists, people from all the wider public sector saying like I want to be on your training, like <laughs> wait. <laughs> so we're looking to like scaling as well uh, that uh, because all of that uh, depends on like practitioners um, having as well like, good examples and uh, making this not just something you can easily do on a training thingy at home but it requires discussion and conversation. Um, and at any time, um, before or after people might um, go on training, they can, they can look up things. So we have uh, pretty detailed uh, guidance on how to meet the service standard. We've created a thing called the service manual. So this helps teams to create and run great public services that meet that standard. So it covers uh, things like how to set up a team or how to do user research or choosing the right technology. So all of that uh, you can find online if you just look for GAVI-K service manual, this is all accessible, well, because the taxpayer has been paying for that, so why should we hide that? Um, so all of that stuff is available, um, have a look if you're interested. Um, and one of the, one of the chapters um, that I think uh, Michelle uh, quoted um, has a dedicated area around designing good services, and it lists um, characteristics of good service design and good services. It's a, it's a pretty uh, good read. Um, and as I um, set, we have to work across organizational boundaries and even there we were able to like write out like what this might look like and how to do it. Okay, and now a practical example. Um, so this is what this, uh, yeah, what this looks like um, in real. Um, so this is, a, this is a very lovely government example. So um, this is an example from Czech State Pension Service. So people, well, they want to know like how much state pension they can expect. And in the UK, there's not much, but I mean, it's at least something. So um, in the past, they've been receiving this letter um, from the Department of Work and Pensions. And well, it's supposed to tell them exactly that, like how much pension to expect. Um, but that thing um, really only makes sense if you have the other letter from the tax department that tells you on eight pages what contributions you have made throughout your work life. But all those numbers, again, don't really make sense without this 32-page brochure from, again, the first department. So eventually you have something or like 40 pages to read in order to, well, understand how much pension you can expect, which of course makes no sense. People just want to want to know this, like how much pension can I expect? And unfortunately, this answer sits at least between two government departments. Um, that finally then started working together, doing research uh, into like what detailed information people really need and also like figuring out where this data actually sits. Um, and here you see a few um, digital versions that they have been creating over the years. Um, some were kind of like early um, alpha sketches um, that then were way more refined. So in the, in the very fast, the very first version, you had kind of like the, the, the essence from these kind of like 40 pages, but people still, well, no surprise, um, found it difficult um, to 
figure out like quickly what is the information that I really need to know. Uh, but as this was an early prototype, um, the team could quickly iterate um, and come to a version that kind of like makes way more sense to users. So throughout user research, they were um, able to as well identify like um, more granular user needs. Wait, what's the most pension that I can expect? One of the one of the challenges specifically uh, around that was uh, that uh, the legal team insisted on on certain like um, pieces of text and cer certain jargon, um, and only when the legal team joined the user research sessions and like consistently saw um, people failing, they were kind of like. Uh, slowly um, willing to give up on some of things um, and allowing um, the, the, the designers to like become more visual in, in some of those things. So all of those things are like real data specifically for, for the individual, not just like really like broad data. Um, and yeah, slowly like being able to delete a lot of uh, legal jargon. And this service today in its performance looks like that. The digital channel is about 20 times more uh, used than the paper version. And the overall satisfaction rate, uh, I think, is roughly uh, around 90%, uh, uh, which is fabulous as well. So a lot of people using it, and it works. Um, but um, I talked about um, um, different channels and working across those. So all the learnings from the online channel were brought back as well to the paper version. So this is the original paper template that people simply didn't understand. And this is the, the latest version of that, where all the learnings from the digital channel were like, brought over um, and are now, as well, equally, equally well understood um, as the digital version. And even behind uh, the curtain, this is the agent view. So if there's a caseworker who has to look into that, they can see all the data from the two different departments in just one view. So if still someone is like, calling up, all the stuff is in, is in one place and they can answer the question straight away. Um, so actually we can get to a situation that looks a bit more like that, where all services are shaped around user needs and where government as well is shaped around user-focused <laughs> services. And yeah, so we've seen that we are, we are not alone in that. There are like many people doing similar things. And um, Kara and as well a bit myself, we've been building uh, quite a massive international community of design-minded um, public servants. So this is a photograph from a conference we run uh, running last summer, where we had people from 26 countries joining, which was pretty amazing. So if you're working uh, in government, uh, local government, central government, join uh, our growing community. We're now about 1,500 people uh, from 60 countries. Uh, we have monthly calls. Uh, just last week, we had people dialing in from India, Australia, Belgium, Canada, literally from all over the world. And we have events like the one um, tomorrow with Code for America. Uh, we do um, other conferences in June uh, in a lovely uh, Edinburgh, uh, another one in Rotterdam. So please join us there or on Slack. Um, and that's it. That's me. <laughs>